Well, good morning and welcome to Cross Community Church. Uh, If you weren't with us last week, we talked a lot about things that you should avoid, about how to keep ourselves from becoming stained by the world or being overly influenced by the world. And what we talked about in particular was developing a biblical worldview. That means that as you approach the world and you see certain situations, you don't just automatically see them through the same same lens of culture or, or the worldly ideas that we would normally bring to the table. But instead, we would seek to look at everything in our world through the lens of Scripture, through the lens of Christ. How would God want us to see this? And so we saw there were three tools that kind of help us with that, where we could be transformed by renewing our minds instead of being conformed to our culture. And so God has given us the Word. So we look into the Word. One of the most important questions you will ask in your life, uh, in your marriage, in all of your relationships, in your business deals would be, what does the Word of God have to say about this? How should I conduct myself in the midst of this? How should I view this situation? On, uh, in addition to the Word, God has given us His Spirit to open our eyes to the Word, to lead us to the things that we need to be led to. And finally, God has given us His church to help renew our minds, for people to encourage us. Because sometimes we miss it, right? Sometimes we need people to say, hey, you're, you're way off. Like, look, look, it's very obvious. Here's what the Word says. You need to walk in this. Now, where last week we talked about what we ought to avoid to keep ourselves from becoming stained by the world, the things we should avoid, this week we're going to talk about the things that Jesus would want, us, want to lead us to, the things that we should embrace, the things that we should strive for. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to James chapter 2. We're going to begin in verse 8. Now, where, where James has been, he has been encouraging these young believers, uh, really kind of... Uh, scolding them a bit for showing favoritism to people. Uh, If you were rich, you got a place of honor. If you were poor, you had to sit on the floor, even in their assembly. And so he's been scolding them for that, but he's going to turn directions here a bit today and encourage them towards something greater. In verse 8, he says, If, however, even though you've been screwing it up and making mistakes in your life, your relationships haven't been the way they should, if, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. If ever you wanted kind of an attaboy, a high five from the Bible. If you find yourself at a place that you are loving your neighbor as yourself, you can just go ahead, give yourself the back pat, high five yourself, be like, all right, I'm about 50% of the way there. I've got the, the horizontal relationships taken care of. I am doing a good job in relating to people. Now, if you've been around very long, you will know it's, it's really hard to love your neighbor as yourself, isn't it? Isn't it difficult to be like, hey, I care about as much about their needs as I do my own? As a matter of fact, my needs kind of scream at me. You know what I mean? When I, or, or even my desires, they tend to remind me a lot. When I have a need, my body's really good at identifying that and letting me know. Uh, if you have a need, I'm too busy worried about mine, right? It can be really difficult to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I want to work through a couple of, uh, of words specifically in this first verse. Uh, James says, if you fulfill the royal law. You know, this, this phrase might seem a little bit odd to you, but the, the reason that this love your neighbor as yourself is called a royal law, there's a couple of reasons here. So the first one is that it happens to come from God. So just a side note, if you are the creator of the world, if you speak everything that we know and and see into existence, you get to make the rules, right? This is called the royal law because it comes from God. The king of kings and lord of lords said it, so we just call it the royal law. The second reason that this is called the royal law, love your neighbor as yourself, is because every other rule governing our relationships with each other subordinates to this rule. As a matter of fact, if you will just love your neighbor as yourself going to take care of the stealing and the lying and the killing and all the other things that are going on. So this law is kind of the supreme law governing all of our relationships to one another. Love your neighbors yourself. So it's royal because God said it and it's royal because it's kind of the supreme law that governs all of our relationships. So he says, if you will do this, if you will fulfill, if you are fulfilling the royal law according to scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, we've been through this before, but I think it's important to point out What exactly are we talking about when we talk about love? Are we talking about what I feel after a long day when I roll into Brahms and order that hot fudge sundae? I mean, it just like, it just does something in me. Like, it just warms my whole body. I mean, like, every fiber of my being is just enthralled with hot fudge over ice cream, right? Is this the love we're talking about? Well, no, that's not it at all. 
Uh, Is this a love that happens when you're watching a romantic movie with your spouse or significant other or Sadly, you might even be alone, and your heart is warmed when that handsome young man glances over and catches the eye of that beautiful young lady, and all of a sudden, you just kind of feel this tingly thing, you're like, oh my gosh, they're in love, even though they're actors, right? I mean, is that that love, or is love something more significant? As believers, again, trying to adopt a biblical worldview where we look at the world through the lens of Scripture, we know that God himself is love. That love is rooted in the nature and character of God. And so as we seek to understand what James is telling us to do here in calling us to love one another, we look to Jesus. We look to Christ. We look to God and how he has loved us. In trying to boil this down, I've given a definition of love that's simply this. It is sacrificially seeking the good of another. We're going to dig into this a little bit more later, but it's sacrificially seeking the good of somebody else. Now, this is loving your neighbor as yourself. Uh, I I talked about how we're pretty good at knowing what we desire, right? The other day, uh, I was washing dishes in my house. I'm not trying to act like I'm awesome, by the way. It happens like once a week. But I was indeed washing dishes in my kitchen, and my wife said something really funny to me. I'm I'm feeling pretty big time because I'm washing dishes. She, She walks up to me, and she says, are you doing what you want to do? Like, she kind of put the ball on the tee there, right? I mean, I should have just, like, you know, reared back, and it, but I didn't. Uh, I should have said something like, babe, because I love you so much, washing dishes is such a joy that I could serve you in this way. Like, you're so amazing. This is just exactly what I want to be doing in service to you. Uh, <clears throat> that's not what I did. I was just like, no. I don't ever want to wash dishes, you know. Like, this is not any fun. And so she kind of goes about her way. And I was thinking about, I, actually, I was kind of carried away in a vision, if you will, about what do I want to be doing right now? And I'm having visions of me being in my recliner, you know, and so the 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 room is peaceful and serene except for the explosions in the action movie I'm watching, you know. There are people bringing me drinks and and life is just really good. I happen to be pretty conscious of my own needs and wants and desires. When we think about loving our neighbor as ourself, we think about meeting their needs, their wants, and their desires as much as we think about meeting our own. As much as loving ourselves involves others serving and caring for us as we sit in our recliners or wherever that would be for you, uh, loving our neighbors involves us serving and caring for and meeting the needs of others. So James is like, hey, if you're doing that, if you are seeking to meet the needs and care for other people in the same way you want to have your needs met and care for other people, you're good. But then he's going to take kind of a, a sidestep for us. He's going he's to begin to kind of drill into maybe what was happening in the hearts of the believers that he was writing to. These young believers, newer in Christ, who had kind of adopted this attitude of favoritism. Uh, I'm going to read to you, if you don't mind, James chapter 2, verse 4, because it's going to inform what he's about to say here in verses 9 through 11. In James uh, chapter 2, verse 4, he's been pushing them against favoritism, and he says this, Have you not made distinctions among yourselves, choosing to honor those with wealth? If you came in, you rolled into their church, if you will, as much as there was, you know, our understanding of church. If you rolled in wearing a nice suit, like you had nice fringe on your garment, these people would have said to you, tell you what, you get the lazy boy. You get to sit at this place of distinction and honor because you are obviously an important person. Um, If you rolled in having fed the cows and you're a little bit dirty or smelly or you don't seem to be dressed in as nice of clothes as everyone else, they would say, tell you what, why don't you take, take a seat at my feet? sit on this little footstool here. You're not as important as what they were saying. So James is writing to them. He says in verse 4, Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Now what was happening, they were indeed judging. They were making distinctions, but they weren't doing it based upon the law or any other righteous standard. They were making distinctions based upon how much money do you have? How powerful are you? How influential are you in this world? So that's the judging they were doing. Now James is going to point them to what judging would would do in their lives. So verse 9 here, he says, But if you show partiality, if you're one of these people, rich people get the lazy boy, poor people sit on the floor, if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. 
He's like, hey guys, remember you who made unjust distinctions, who made unjust judgments? I need you to take a minute and look at your own life. Because you're judging people based upon unfair standards, unbiblical standards, not even the standard of righteousness. Let's just look at your life for a minute. If we were going to judge you according to the law, you would be rendered guilty. You would be rendered guilty. You would need be deserving of punishment. So he's pointing them toward their own behaviors. Do you remember your own sin? Look here in verse 11. For he who said do not commit adultery also said don't commit murder. Now if you do not commit adultery but you do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. You ever do this in your life a little bit? Where you think there, there's like different levels of bad? Do y'all do this? So there's like I mean, there's like murder, right? That's obviously up there. You shouldn't do that. But a little while, well, it's a little bit lesser, right? Um, there, if you get just smashed drunk on the weekends, that's, that's maybe one of those things. It's lower than murder, right? But, but it's not, it, obviously, it's not as bad as you just overeat in the same way, right? I mean, so what we often do is we make distinctions. I mean, the funny thing about this argument, literally someone would be saying, hey, I tell you what, I may have cheated on my wife, but at least I didn't kill anybody, right? I mean, that's kind of the, the argument. Being, or you could switch that and say, you know what, I may have murdered someone someone, but at least I didn't cheat on my wife. James is intentionally trying to draw kind of a funny distinction here among people that would say, well, at least I didn't break that rule. For the people who were showing favoritism, they were saying, well, at least I didn't do this other thing. I didn't kill anyone. I didn't cheat on my wife. I didn't have an affair, so I must be okay. And what James is saying is, listen, if you broke the law at any point, like you're guilty, you're a lawbreaker, you are sinful. When we think about judgment, when we find ourselves sinful, like if we'll just all admit, this would be Romans 3, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, we're all sinful, then ultimately the wages of that sin is death. He's reminding these believers, hey, did you forget that you're sinful? Like, if we're going to talk about judging people, look at you according to the law. You are deserving of judgment. You're judging people based on unjust standards. Did you forget where you've come from? Now, he's going to point them to something much greater. Verse 12, he says, So speak and so act. We're going to camp out here for a minute, so just kind of hang with me. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of Liberty. Now, this law of liberty, we've heard about it in chapter 1 already. It basically, it would encompass the entire word of God. What is the law of liberty? I'm going to give you something broader. The entire word of God. Now, I say that because you have to understand what the law of liberty is in light of the entire counsel of Scripture. So, if you are going to look at the Old Testament, you know that God made a perfect world. There was no sin, no suffering, no pain, no shame, no hurt, right? That is the world God created. When humankind entered into the world... We started sinning, and it got ugly, like an episode of Springer, very quickly, all right? I mean, things went bad when people were created. Sin begins to to grow and, and snowball, and all of a sudden, the world is very badly broken, so much so that Paul is quoting the psalmist in Romans chapter 3. Here's what he would say about you and about me. Paul would say this was true of himself. As we think about ourselves before God, according to this law of liberty, looking at the Old Testament, here's what it would say about us. There is none righteous, not even one. Not your precious granny, not that precious little child, like there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. Can we just personalize this and and, and know this about ourselves? Our throats can be like open graves. With our tongues, we keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under our lips. Our mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Our feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction, destruction and misery are in our past. What the Old Testament, if nothing else, should convince you of is that you're a sinner. And not just a little one. You're a pretty good sinner. As a matter of fact, it, like we find ourselves filthy and wretched in the sight of God such that even our righteous deeds are called filthy rags before God. 
As you read this law of liberty, the whole Bible, as you open and you begin to read the Old Testament, you see the law, you see your condition before God, you should find yourself dirty. You should find yourself sinful. You should find yourself unworthy of any love that God would ever give you, unworthy of any grace or mercy that might be shown. You should find yourself guilty. But there's good news. The law of liberty isn't just kind of part of the Bible. It's not just like the Old Testament. It also encompasses the new. And here's what the New Testament tells you and tells me about ourselves, our wicked, wretched selves who have sinned, that God looked at us in our filth, in our undeserving state, in our sin, in the worst things we've ever done. God knew it all, by the way. He knew the big one you did last week. He knows the big one you're going to do next year. God knew all of it, and he was stirred with love in his heart. That he would offer his son, Jesus. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of that sin is death. And so God demonstrated how much he loves us in this. That in the midst of that sin, he sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for us. What happened for us, as we look about the law of liberty, we see the Old Testament, we were wicked, wretched, undeserving sinners. We find that God happens to love wicked, wretched, undeserving sinners. And what he did was send his son Jesus, where we deserve death. He was like, hey, I'm going to send Jesus to die in your place so that you can be set free from the law of sin and death. Matter of fact, Galatians chapter 1, or Galatians chapter 5 says this. It was for freedom that Christ set you free. Uh, Jesus went to the cross and paid the ransom that you owed, paid, he canceled your debt that you owed because of your sin so that you might not be enslaved to sin anymore, so that you might not be burdened under the law of sin and death anymore, but you might live free. Like you might just be free to live by the Holy Spirit. And he says this though, only don't use that freedom that you have in Christ where your sins have been forgiven, where you've been shown extraordinary mercy even though you were a wretched sinner. Don't use that freedom to indulge your flesh or to bite and devour and to be unkind to other people. But instead, use that freedom to serve one another in love. Like, use what, what, what you've been given in Christ Jesus. I mean, you should, you should act like someone who's been set free. So James says this in verse, verse uh, uh, 12. He says, So speak and so act as condemned criminals who have, been there, who have been set free, as those who were sentenced to die who have now been emancipated. You have been set free by the work of Jesus Christ. So speak and so act as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. The law said you deserve death. But God, in his great love and his mercy shown to you and to me, has been like, you know what? That is what they deserve. But I'm going to go send my son to die that they might have life. James is like, act like people who were on death row, whose sentences have been commuted, whose sins have been wiped away. Speak and act other people like you were this criminal who was guilty and deserving of death who's been given a new lease on life. When you think about how you're going to interact with other people, they're going to sin against you. Your spouse is going to sin against you. So speak and so act as those who have been judged by the law of liberty. Your friends, your co-workers, your kids. Has this ever happened to y'all? Your kids talk to you the way my kids talk to me. So speak and so act as those who would be judged by the law of liberty, the whole counsel of the word of God where we find ourselves guilty and enslaved and really condemned because of our sins. And Jesus, in his love and his mercy for us, says, I'm going to step in there. I'm going I'm to pay their debt. I'm going to ransom them from the death that they deserve so that they might walk in abundance. And so we look to Jesus and we choose to treat one another according to, to this law of liberty. So speak and so act. This is an imperative in the Greek where basically the force of the imperative is, is kind of divided between our words that we say and the things that we do. The words that come out of our mouth should reflect that we have been set free. The actions that we commit toward other people ought to reflect that we are wretched, filthy sinners who have been set free. Then he's going to go on and kind of give, you, give them the alternative to this law of liberty. Like you want to just kind of face hard justice like you're maybe extending to other people. You want to face the consequences of your sin. Here's what it looks like. For judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy. He's like, are you sure? Are you sure you want to judge people? 
Are you sure you're into this judgment instead of mercy thing? Because it wouldn't have worked out very well for you. I'm, I'm kind of adding a little bit there to what James says. I'm trying to bring it to life for you. He says this, mercy triumphs over judgment. As you think about your relationships with other people, in particular those ones that you have difficult time with, are you extending mercy? Are you speaking and acting as someone who was guilty but whose debt has been canceled? As someone who has been set free by Jesus Christ? Here's the deal. James is, is first of all, he's kind of giving you the standard. Love your neighbor as yourself. But that's really hard. I mean, that's, that's extremely difficult to care about my neighbor as much as I care about myself. Like, it isn't easy. It doesn't just flow. Like, it, 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 it doesn't happen. But the way that we do that, he's going to tell us. We, we love our neighbor as ourself by speaking and acting as those who have been judged by the law of liberty. We think upon the gospel of Jesus Christ we allow our minds to be renewed, to be transformed as our minds are renewed as we think about the gospel of Jesus. We constantly think about what God has done for us. And so when someone sins against us, the way that we're able to continue to sacrificially seek their good is because we remember that we sinned against God and he sacrificially sought our good. When, when someone steals something from us, we can continue to, to, to love them and extend grace toward them, be merciful toward them, because that's what God did for us. We continue to look at Jesus, this example for us, the King of kings and the Lord of lords who became our servant. And so we can sacrificially serve and seek the good of other people in our lives. Mercy triumphs over judgment. I want to take just a minute to speak to you about some of the attributes of God's love just for us to think on as the body of Christ together. I want to, I want to take some time and think about what God's love looks like for us and, and hopefully it will stir our affections for him that ultimately what we receive from God what God continually gives to us, listen, you're going to continue to sin, and that is a wonderful reminder of the goodness of God to you. God's going to continue to give you mercy, and as you receive that mercy, God wants you to continue to extend that to other people. So, uh, what are some attributes of God's love? Number one, it is unconditional. God did not find you deserving. God did not find me deserving of love. God didn't find me worthy of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. God did not find me at a place where I somehow merited his favor or I earned that from him. God found me at a huge deficit. What I owed was an extreme debt of sin. And yet God looked upon me. And because it's his nature and his character, he chose to love me unconditionally. Do you know there's freedom in unconditional love? It says, even if I blow it tomorrow, God is still going to love me. I didn't earn it in the first place. I didn't deserve it in the first place. And God freely extended this love and grace and mercy to me. So that means if I mess up tomorrow, I don't have to worry that he's going to somehow take that back. Like God just loves. It's his nature and his character. He loves us unconditionally. That's comforting, isn't it? Like, it's not going to go away. Like, we don't have to, oh, man, I didn't read my Bible. I only got six minutes instead of seven yesterday in the Word, and so God's mad. Or I yelled at my kids again. Or I failed to do the dishes for my wife again. Or I did that big one. I looked at the inappropriate stuff again, so God's going to be mad. Listen, God saw all of your sin. Your sins of yesterday, your sins of today, and your sins of the future. By the way, when Jesus died on the cross, all sins were future, right? All of our sins. We hadn't been born yet. God died for all of your sins. His love is unconditional. It's extended to you. And as such, we think upon that. We remember that. And we extend unconditional love to the people in our lives that are hard to love. Let's be honest. We just went through the holidays. There's some people that are hard to love, right? Some people that make you mad. And like, why would you talk to me that way? Or didn't you appreciate what I... And we extend unconditional love to other people. Uh, the next piece of God's love here is that it is sacrificial. It's sacrificial. Listen, what, what God did for us, it wasn't like a little thing. Sometimes we hear about Jesus dying on the cross, and we, we talk about that. We've said it a thousand times, and so we lose the weight of the fact that God gave his only son. This past uh, weekend, uh, I had a chance to take my son, Logan, my oldest son, uh, to a bowl game. We went and watched OSU play Missouri. 
And man, it was like it was like a boys' trip. We ate like really poorly. He had like a hot dog in one hand, a giant pretzel in another, and a coke between his knees. You know, it was like we ate terrible food, and we we had like a wonderful time of the game. Like one of those weekends in my life that I'm never gonna forget. We were high fiving like crazy people, and just you know hugging people we didn't know, and things went well. And it was one of those weekends that I'm never going to forget. And as I was driving home from, from Memphis, I was thinking about how much I love my son. Like, what a great gift he is to me. And to think that God saw me in my sin against him. All of those times when I've turned my back on God. All those times where I've lied and I've cheated and I've stolen and done all those things. The time where, where I, I mean, I've just blown it before God. And he loved me so much that he was willing to give his son to die in my place. The love of God for us is extraordinarily sacrificial. Like, we don't want to treat that as a, a, a weak thing. I, mean, I want you to think about your kids and how much you love them. And think about giving your kid up for any one of those people who sin against you in your life. And God did that for us. Love of God, it's unconditional. It's sacrificial. And the final thing here is that it, it seeks our good. We don't always see this. We don't always feel this. But God seeks our good. Jesus came that we might have life and we might have it abundantly like people who sinned against him who hurt him who hated him at some point God's like no no I really want to just I want to give my son Jesus I want to love them well seeking their good that they might find abundance in this life and in the eternity that is to come God seeks our good you all do ever do this thing where you kind of want people's actions to catch up with them not yours of course but somebody else's like, boy, she talked bad about me. I hope that comes back around on her. You know, you kind of rejoice a little bit when things go bad. You're like, oh, secretly, listen, that's not what God does for us. He always seeks our good. He wants to see us live the fullest, most abundant life we could possibly live in Christ Jesus. That's what love is. It's unconditional. It's sacrificial. It's seeking the good of others. And here's what God wants for us, both in this church and outside of this church that we would go and love people like this, that we would love our kids like that, that our kids could grow up with this unconditional love, that we could love our spouses like this, like, all right, so you didn't do the dishes today. I'm still going to choose to love you, that we would love our coworkers and, and our neighbors and the people that we might see with this kind of love. Did you know, you may not know this, but there were people who were up here all week that you never did see, that because of what Jesus Christ has done for them, because of this sacrificially seeking the good that God has done for them, they came up here and they prepared this facility and they cleaned because Jesus sacrificially sought their good. They were seeking yours. There were people that met early this morning to, to gather and to pray that God would do a work in your heart specifically, that God would move in our midst as his church. And they were doing that. They were sacrificially seeking your good through prayer because that's what Jesus did for them. He sacrificially sought their good. There are people back in the back that are teaching your I'm not trying to be overly harsh. Your kids can be a little frustrating sometimes, right? They don't always pay attention, right? I, my kids are back there. I know that. There are difficult kids back there, and they are serving, and they were teaching, and they've been preparing all week, sacrificially seeking the good of your children because that's what Jesus has done for them. There are people that were greeting out here, welcoming you to this church because their hearts are filled with love because God has extended that love to them. There are men and women that stood on this stage and they wanted to lead us to, to, to remind us of who Jesus is, of his goodness, that we would sing and celebrate the goodness of God together. And they were sacrificially seeking your good because that's what Jesus did for them. And when you leave today and you sit down at that table and there's a waitress, I want you to sacrificially seek her good. And if she doesn't give you the best service, still lay a fat tip down because you're sacrificially seeking her good. Listen, the sacrifices that we make for other people, I promise you they're going to pale in comparison to the sacrifices that God has made for us. And the service that you would offer to other people, whatever that would look like, is going to pale in comparison to what God has offered to you. And so we leave here and we go serve in our homes, our spouses. We serve one another. We serve our kids. We go and serve our coworkers. We go and serve our classmates if you go to school. And it's my prayer that as the people of God, we would be shaped by the gospel of Jesus Christ, that this would be true of us, uh, James would kind of give us a high five at the end. He would say, hey, if you're fulfilling the royal law of Scripture, loving your neighbors yourself, you are doing well. I pray that 2019 would be a, a year that we are found doing well, loving our neighbor 
as ourself. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, help us to see the extent, the bigness, the vastness of your sacrifice for us. That you offered your son Jesus on the cross, your perfect child, to be unjustly accused, convicted. Lord, they abused him, they beat him. And Lord, you did that. You offered that sacrifice for us. Father, would you help us to remember that? May we be a people who are shaped by that. That we would look to you to see how we should treat other people. Father, would you stir in our hearts love that comes from you. May we be reminded of this with every sin and every failure in our lives. May we be reminded of how unconditional and sacrificial your love is for us, for how much you seek our good. And Lord, may we extend that to other people. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.